Hey guys, welcome back to day 86 of reading your Bible in a year. If you've never joined me before, then I'm currently reading through the entire Bible in a year. There's more information in the description of this video about how you can get started on that journey with me. Today we're talking about Gideon, and Gideon was one of the judges of Israel. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I'll catch you up with a little bit of a brief history. So the Jewish people or the Israelites are living in the promised land. Hundreds of years before this, God made a promise to a man named Abraham that he would give him this land. And then through trials like slavery, wilderness journey, all sorts of stuff, they end up in the promised land. And what happens? Why is they going to the promised land? They start falling away from God. And the book of Judges is actually like time-wise covers a lot of time, a lot of years. So we see generations. They go, they're following God, and then they don't follow God. They start sinning. Consequences of sin come. Then they turn back to God. Then they start sinning. Consequences come. Then they turn back. To, and we're just seeing this pattern of going up and down and up and down instead of them consistently following the Lord. So God raises up judges after they start sinning. The consequences are typically they get captured by another nation. So God raises up a judge or you might better understand this as maybe like a tribal leader. Like a judge would judge issues, but that was not their sole purpose. Not like in our modern context, when we say the word judge, your whole job is just being a deciding factor in a court or mediating in a mediating for a jury. That's not the case with these sort of people. So Gideon, who was he and what can we learn from him? Well, the first thing that pops into my mind is that Gideon was a coward he didn't exactly act like this brave warrior type of person that we would expect. We don't see Gideon doing the same things that David did. David walked in front of you know hundreds of people and fought a giant, and Gideon is questioning God over and over. But this is how Gideon is first described by God. It says in Judges uh, 11, it says, or in Judges 6, 12, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Gideon, and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And this is this is why I called Gideon a coward. He, Sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why are all these things happening to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and has handed us over to the Midianites. So, Midian, I mean, Gideon keeps questioning this angel. He seems like a coward, like someone that's not going to, you know, stand up and fight for God. But here's the thing that I want you to understand about the book of Judges is that God is constantly using people that probably wouldn't be described as the perfect person. He's not using people that it, that we might think of who should be used. It kind of goes to show you that of all the land, this is the closest guy that God can follow or this is the guy that God chooses to be used because he's probably the only one that's really available to God. I mean, even Gideon's father is worshiping Baal or false or false God. What's so neat about this is this is later in the chapter, and this is a kind of a cool preaching point, but it talks about how Gideon destroyed the altar and the, basically they set up poles to worship other gods, and he chopped down the pole and used that as the firewood to burn an altar to God. So it's like the things that could be used to make a stumble, God uses for his glory. Really neat. But Gideon, what he does is he always does what God asks. Now, he may not do it with a lot of bravery, or at least he, how he talks isn't very brave, but he, he always does it. God tells him, cut down this pole. So what does he do? He goes down at night and cuts it down. Not brave, right? Kind of a cowardly way to do it, but he does it. And then when people ask, you know, who did this? He took credit for it. And then God asked him to go and basically fight a battle. Now, what's so interesting about how God fights battles, it's the exact opposite way of how we fight battles. So we fight battles kind of tactically, like how can we win this? How can I go into this battle to win it? Uh, there was a show I watched with a spy and he said that spies don't fight fair, spies fight to win. Well, God does it kind of the opposite way. He starts off with 23,000 men and he tells them, if anyone's scared, go home. So 12,000 of them leave. Now you're going up against an army with 120,000 people. You tell if anyone's scared to go home. So half your army leaves. What do you start doing? Well, if I'm in their situation, I start freaking out. 
But what we can see is, is that God did this because of Deuteronomy, or Gideon followed this out because of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, we see that there are laws set up that if anyone's scared, they should go home. If anyone's just gotten married, they should go home. If anyone just planted a vineyard, they should go home. Like It's all about dwindling down the army. And I've talked about this before, but God's setting up a way that if they win, no one can be like, oh, it's because of my incredible military tactics. No, God is setting up a way that if they win, it doesn't bring glory to Gideon. It brings glory to God. So they dwindle it down, and God dwindles it down more to 300. So they get 300 men, and they go attack this place. And what happens? Gideon destroys the Midianites, and then peace is brought to the land. And I don't want you to take away the wrong message from this, because what I'm trying to tell you is that God uses people that are available. He doesn't use people that are perfect. But the issue with this is some people take it to the extreme. They say, oh, then I can do whatever I want. Grace is applied. We're fine and dandy, ready to go. But look at what happens after Gideon dies. So Gideon brought peace to the land. The people are not following these false idols anymore. They are worshiping God. They have cast out the evil people in their land and destroyed them. And Gideon's gone on this incredible war journey that's in chapter 8. It's really neat if you can read. But what does he do at the end of his life? He doesn't set up ways for the people after him to follow God. He doesn't demonstrate what it's like to live with God intimately. Instead, he kind of creates this ephah, which was kind of like for him a way to remember his war battle. But since it was golden, the people started worshiping it. And they, as the Bible says, they prost- Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping the images of Baal and making Baal their God. What I want you to pick up on is as you continue to read through the book of Judges is that it kind of starts off like this. We're going up and then we're going down and then we're going up and we're going down and we're going up. So the the, the trend line is like this. As we go through the book of Judges, it does get worse. With every judge, they leave it off worse. So you can be used by God today. Praise the Lord. He can use guilty, filthy sinners just like us. But we have to realize that when we are being used by God, people are watching us. So we should, as James says, we're held to a higher standard. So just kind of something that you should note. If I'm going to be used by God, people are going to be watching me in that journey. Anyways, I hope this encourages you and builds your faith. If you want to keep going through the Bible with me this year, then be sure to hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you back here tomorrow.